for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled today is author Jeff Burkhart and designer Susie Tompkins. Jeff Burkhart is a native Angelino. His schooling all took place on the west side of Los Angeles. <laughs> west Hollywood Elementary School, Emerson Junior High School, University High School, and UCLA. And he even lives in Beverly Hills, not far from our studios. As a writer, Jeff, were you um, aware of expanding your horizon, or well, does it all take place here? <laughs> yeah, I'm a slow mover, I guess. Uh, I was always interested in films, and it seemed to me that it was silly to move anywhere else, because this is where it was happening. And I wound up, I, I was born in Beverly Hills, and I wound up in Beverly Hills, and I just kind of like... And you're still just here. Just never left the neighborhood, you know. <laughs> I like the delis. So, so did you think that you were going to be writing about films or writing I films? I originally started writing for theater. I wanted to write for theater, and, and I collaborated with Sammy Kahn, the lyricist, on three plays. And uh, one was done in London, one was done in New York. They weren't successful, and I came out without a nickel. So I, I said, this is the wrong field to be in. And, uh, but I decided to go into film production. But in the interim, I had jobs selling antiques, doing this, working in bookstores, retail bookstores and things. Almost like an actor. Yeah, you had to same sort of thing. <laughs> support yourself. Yeah, and then finally I got a job working as an assistant for Franco Zeffirelli and, and uh, Dyson Lovell. And I worked on The Champ and they realized I could write. And so I started doing little rewrites on the set. And then I worked on Endless Love and would do the same in the same capacity. And uh, they kept encouraging me to write as a screenwriter and uh, so I did. I got a job writing a re remake of an American tragedy for Universal which never got, came very close to getting made and it was for Michelle Pfeiffer before she was known. She was, I saw her out of Greece too and the whole thing was set in Palm Springs <laughs> because I remember there was real rich people up here in trailer parks here <laughs> and it actually worked. It actually worked and from that script I got a lot of work. When you were working for Zeffirelli, were you working here in Hollywood, or did you have to go to Rome? Oh, no, no, we worked here. We worked in uh, Hollywood and worked in New York. Uh, I, w I wouldn't want to work in Rome. Did, that, did, did it change your uh, idea when you, you didn't want to work in Rome? Did you want to no. work in New York? No, I, I always <laughs> dreamed of New York being this great city to work in. Then I got there, and it was like, you know, Schleppville, USA, and it was like, God, what's going on here? No, I didn't like working in New York. Uh, L.A. is the best place for films. I was back to this, expanding your horizons again, but I don't think we're going to get you out of Hollywood. No, I, I'm stuck here. You, so, yeah. you, so they encouraged you, the Zeffirelli Group encouraged you to write, and you did do yes. write two screenplays. Yes, I wrote uh, Where the Boys Are. <laughs> well, we all have to have one of those. And but, but it got made. You it know? got made, and a lot of people saw it. Yeah, and then I wrote another film called Cloak and Dagger, which got made. I didn't see and that, that one. That was with Henry Thomas, who was from E.T., and he grew up a little too fast. And uh, then I wrote a uh, script called Defenseless with Barbara Hershey and Sam Shepard. And, you know, actually, for the period of time that I was writing screenplays, which was a nine-year period, I got three films made, and it's, that's not bad batting average. As a, as a screenplay writer, mm -hmm. did, were you involved in the production part of oh, it? Oh, no, no. It's the old joke about the, the Polish starlet who comes to Hollywood and sleeps with the screenwriter. <laughs> you know, I mean, Forget it's it. the worst. I mean, you have no control. <laughs> Absolutely no control. It, I mean, they're the first to go. So, then we must have given up your control and moved into books. Well, it was a funny thing. I've got this. I've, I've always loved movies. I've always, and I'm kind of, I get at least 10 calls a day from people asking me, did so who did this? Who directed that? Who wrote this? Well, who was the sound man on Is that? Is that right? Yeah, I've got this, you know, encyclopedia knowledge of film. And uh, a friend of mine came up to me, Bruce Stewart, who is the co-author of the book, and he said, 
is it true that Groucho Marx was supposed to play Rhett Butler? And I laughed and I said, well, actually it was. It came from Margaret Mitchell. She was so hounded by the press during the Gone with the Wind uh, casting campaign that they've, uh, the press asked her, who do you want to play Rhett Butler? And she sarcastically snapped back, the only person I had in mind was Groucho Marx. Oh. And it hit the New York Times front page. And so it was like, I said, so in a way he was kind of in the running. I said, but there's a lot of these stories. And we started bannering them about. And I said, you know, this has never been written down before. And it's just fun information. You know, it's not particularly vicious or, or as I say, everyone has the right, you know, to, to make a mistake, uh -huh. you know. And uh, uh, we put together a treatment. We kind of felt like Spin and Marty because we'd never written a book before. But was it also like putting together a screenplay? You put together a treatment? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was very, very similar to that. A proposal. A proposal. I did a proposal. I had worked before on a, I had had a previous experience of working on a book called Only the Best with uh, Stuart Jacobson. Oh, I remember. That's what I thought. That's why I thought you had written more yes, books. Yes, and you yes. said this was your very first yeah, book, I, though. That was an idea that he and I had originated. And I helped prod Jean Howard along with her book on Hollywood. But Only the Best was a uh, very expensive uh, Yeah, it was a big gift, gift book. book. And, uh, Nothing it, like this. No, not, not at all. This is a cheapie, guys. <laughs> <This> but, <laughs> so, so let's 14 just, bucks takes it away. Let's just tell them what this is. It's for Crown Books, <laughs> yes. and it's called uh, Hollywood's First Choices, mm -hmm. How the Greatest Casting Decisions Were Made. Yes. And you gave us a little bit and of uh, how you found out about some of these casting right. decisions. Well, what it is, it's uh, the book, really, the premise is, who was going to play who and what part and didn't do it mm -hmm. for whatever reasons and who did. Why did you think that would be interesting to the public? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really? God, I don't know. Is it? But it was. Is it? Joan, these questions. Uh, I because it is interesting. I mean, everyone you can imagine because you can imagine it. It's a popular media. Everyone's seen these movies. Right. And so if I talk about the Wizard of Oz and say. Well, it wasn't Judy Garland, it was Shirley Temple. Right. You can imagine Shirley Temple, whether she's bad or good in the part. You know, and actually there's a million stories. But, and then how did you research them all? Well, you know, oddly, as I said before, a lot of it was stored in my head already. You mean you had them? I had a lot of that information in there, and that's why Bruce, when he came, he says, you're the perfect person for this book. And then I used the uh, Margaret Herrick Library quite a bit. Oh, uh, which is? The Academy. Uh, Academy of Motion Pictures. Charts. I went through the old varieties and old Hollywood reporters, uh, all the old Hedda Hopper columns and Luella oh, Parsons columns, and then in a lot of biographies of directors, uh, actors, they always mention movies that they didn't do. I see. You know, and or that were offered. And I just, I always think it's kind of a hoot to find out, you know. Did you throw a lot of information away? Did you have too much for the book? Oh, I definitely have enough for two or three more books. It'd be easy to put together two or three more books because what I found the first time out was that on contemporary people, they were very suspicious. They wanted, they were very uh, guarded. I see. Because they didn't know what the book was going to be like. I and, see. and they didn't want to look like jerks. Well, I'm very, I'm not, I was, it's not a bitchy book per se, but it's a gossipy book. I was just going to say, it's gossip that lasts. Yeah. It's not gossip that's timely yeah, yeah, or yeah. can be proved different because yeah. you've already got the beginning, the middle, and the end. Yeah, and, and, it's, and, and it's, all, it's an oral history, too. You know, so I think uh, the second time around will be a lot easier to get into. Right? I'm going to show a couple of these pictures that are probably in the book mm -hmm. and tell us why we're looking at Montgomery Clift. Because he's so good looking. He really no. is. <laughs> he's still, uh, well, because the story behind Montgomery Clift was uh, about Sunset Boulevard. Sunset Boulevard was originally written for Mae West to play Norma Desmond. And when Billy Wilder and, and Charlie Brackett gave her the script and went up to Ravenswood for lunch, she threw him out of her apartment around halfway into the story saying, I'm not playing this part. <laughs> and Montgomery Cliff was supposed to play Joe Guinness. Ah. And he backed out 10 days before shooting. Oh, dear. So yeah. who's this? That's James Mason. Now, James Mason was Edward Albee's first choice for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. He wanted him to play George. And, uh, and who got the role? Richard Burton. Richard Burton, okay. Now everyone's little favorite, Shirley Temple. Uh, she was uh, the, the reason for the Wizard of Oz coming into existence. They were desperate. MGM was desperate to have her star in the Wizard of Oz playing Dorothy. And Daryl Zana, they promised Daryl Zana, Clark Gable, anyone he wanted. 
And he just said no. And he took? And he and they got their second best choice was Judy Garland, <laughs> which is probably the greatest second best choice. <laughs> I just like that picture because oh. Judy, I mean, Shirley. Shirley, I don't know how she got in that dress, but it was like a... She she actually made, Zanuck did do a big vanity production fantasy film for called The uh, Bluebird, which uh, ruined her um, career. Ruined her. <laughs> you know. And this? <laughs> That's Marlon Brando, looking probably the best that we'll ever see him look. He was the original choice for Lawrence of Arabia. And he did, why didn't he take it? Well, because he decided to do uh, Mutiny on the Bounty instead. Mm -hmm. But also there was a furor in the British press when he was announced that he was going to be playing Lawrence. How can an American be playing Lawrence? And I thought you were going to say couldn't ride a horse. Well, Here's someone who can ride a horse. <laughs> yeah, he can ride a horse. Well, if we think of Marlon Brando now, you just think of camels buckling under in the sand, you <laughs> right. know. But uh, Robert Redford turned down a lot of parts. He turned down a lot of parts early in his career, particularly Virginia Woolf, and he was supposed to be the graduate. And Dustin Hoffman got, got that Got the right. part, yes. Okay. Claudette Colbert, she was Margot Channing. This is the best picture, too. Totally 40s, huh? Yeah, totally 40s. She was supposed to be Margot Channing. She wrenched her back was and could not move for six weeks, and they put Betty Davis in 10 days before they were going to shoot, and she was, according to Joe Mankiewicz, letter perfect. He never had to tell her anything. And all this fabulous jewelry that she has on, uh, just all yeah. 40s. Of course, that's the thing I look at. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. Her nickname was Uncle Claude. One of the other <laughs> things um, in the book that I thought was really interesting were the little tidbits oh, at yeah, the end, fun, the yeah. casting tidbits. Um, the, we talked about uh, Robert Redford was originally set to play the down and out attorney in the verdict, but pulled out of the project because he felt the main character was too seedy. Mm -hmm. So Paul, Paul Newman. Newman replaced him. If Robert Redford um, had taken the role, do you think he would have been nominated as best actor? Uh, perhaps, perhaps, but I, I don't think he would have been as good as Paul Newman. Paul Newman allowed, allowed himself to look terrible. He did so that know, so and and really set the part. Robert Redford still to this day I think has a problem with vanity. The uh, another one, I because these things are interesting. After making this property as condemned in 1966, Natalie Wood decided to take some time off from films. During this period, she was offered the leads in Rosemary's Baby, Bonnie and Clyde and The Diary of a Mad Housewife. Mm -hmm. She turned them all down and finally returned to the screen as Bob and Carol, I Bob mean, with. Carol, yeah, Bob, Carol, Ted, and Alice. Do you think that was a good move on her part? No. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest with you, in a word, no. Uh, I mean, I think those roles that she turned down were awfully good. Rosemary's Baby, she would have been wonderful in it. Wonderful. But, um, Bob, Carol, it was really kind of a supporting role because uh, um, Elliot Gould and um, Diane Cannon stole that movie. So, uh, and so, so she could she have been the like lead in one of those other. Um, Glenn Close achieved stardom when she played the villainous lead in the 1986 thriller *Fatal Attraction*. Mm. Uh, she was formally associated as a good girl. Yeah, she was the angel. She right. was the angel. And so, Deborah Winger and Barbara Hershey turned down that role. Mm -hmm. And Glenn Close took it, and I don't think either one of those actresses could have been as good as Glenn Close was, because I think she made the entire movie. And she made a new career for herself. Oh yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, she was the bad girl. You she, know? And she she did. She's singing yeah. and. Yeah, uh, she's singing just blocks singing, away. Singing. <laughs> She'll be singing on Broadway forever now. Forever. And and we're gonna look for more books from Jeff Burkhart yeah. because we can't read it all in one yeah. one day. It's available at all the bookstores. Well, I think this is something you can always have. You can take this on the plane. It's a perfect That's, plane book, isn't it? and it's a perfect bathroom book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go away, because the, uh, the mannequins on the set have clothes on them designed by Susie Tompkins, and she'll be with us after the break. Be back in a minute. We're back. We're back with designer Susie Tompkins, and I'm Joan Quinn. Susie is a native of San Francisco. In 1968, she started the Plain Jane Dress Company with her friend Jane Tice. 
after a year in business doing everything themselves, even delivering crows from the back of a station wagon, um, they made a go of it. Susie's husband, Doug, then came in and reorganized the company and named it Esprit de Corps. The company rose to be one of the world's largest junior sportswear manufacturers. What did you attribute the success of Esprit de Corps? You know, people ask me that all the time. And <laughs> Um, I think part of our success was because we weren't so driven to be successful. Really, we just um, wanted to learn, wanted to have fun, wanted to create things that we wanted for ourselves. Were you a seamstress? No, and I'm st I don't know anything about sewing. Was Jane no. a seamstress? No. Well, how did you get into designing clothes then? Well, we just, we'd been in Europe. I, I um, made a visit to her. She was modeling in Paris and I went over to visit her and spent about 10 days with her and we went around everywhere and when I came back to San Francisco I wanted to find clothes like I'd seen in Paris and it just um, dawned on me that that's what we needed and there was I was like 25 at the time and once you'd been to Paris and England I'm sure that I hadn't gone to England at that point, but I know later when I went to England, I had the same feeling. And then you'd come back to America, you realize what we were missing in America. But is it because you were 25 at the time that we called it was junior sportswear? What, how does that fit into the line? I don't think it was called junior sportswear then. I think junior became a category or it became a niche for the department stores to. Um, categorize themselves for the customer and junior is like a, it's like a young person teen on and I like to think of it as just a youthful person I don't think it's just a teenager but you know if you like to dress in a youthful way that's the you're uh, at Beverly Hills I'm Agnes mm -hmm. with a, a line that's called Susie right. Tompkins right now you put your name on it after a while right well because we found that people thought of Esprit as a junior resource and although we did a lot of designs and styles for an older customer, a more sophisticated customer, they just thought Esprit was young and so we started the Susie Tompkins and it's been very successful. Well Susie Tompkins always was designing though, right? Right, but <laughs> the, Esprit, the name Esprit really connotates junior and young and also it's difficult for us to use some of the fabrications in Esprit that we want to use in Susie Tompkins. We really can't spend that kind of money in a junior range. So at iMagnons, there's a, a little section that's Susie Tompkins? Right. I see. Now, one of the things that you're credited with is bringing Northern California lifestyle to the world to the rest right. of the United States. Right. What is Northern California lifestyle? I like, I like that question because I'm really proud of being a Northern Californian. I'm very proud of what it stands for. And I think that people all over the world look toward California. There's no question about it to see what's happening. And there's the Southern California energy and there's the Northern California energy. And Northern California has always been very free spirited and Southern California is too but Northern California you think of you think of Berkeley and the peace movement and Bohemians mm -hmm. the whole beatnik and the health craze really started up there and it really has been and, and go back to no smoking it's amazing because Did it start there it started in San Francisco and um, so it really then you think Northern California was more activist in all of I think the so. situations, the world situations. Right, and on real kind of social levels. And I think that that also is very much about the way we create our product. It's very much expressing the moment. And I think that what we're experiencing right now um, in our culture, in our history, it's very, very clear in Northern California. I don't, I don't feel it so much when I come down here, but there's a real awareness of the problems and a real concern and a real involvement. And we're looking for solutions and we're very proud about it. And there's a kind of positive energy that we're getting from that. Well, what makes you so unique? One of the things, I'm going to answer my own question, was the marketing and using those real people kind of um, campaign. I right. think it goes back to what you're talking about is the activist. Right. How did you decide to do something like that? Well, it, that was so obvious because we'd been um, looking for good-looking people to put in our ads. And we just looked around and we had the greatest looking people, plus they had, arc, you know, they were character, we knew their character, and we just wanted to promote the individual. And we were very, very early using real people. 
in advertising. That goes way back, and it seemed just a completely natural way of promoting not only your product, but your company and your philosophy and your values. But part of your philosophy was also encouraging art, because you built a sculpture park right. in conjunction with your um, studio, offices, whatever they were in. Right in San right. Francisco. Right. No, we have we have a, a sculpture garden in our park, and then we have a very um, interesting quilt collection, which which we've actually gone from these Amish quilts into a much more kind of eclectic individual quilts that we're that we're putting together now, which is really fun, and you learn so much when when you put something together like that. Are those offices open to the public? Is the park open to the public? The, the park is open to the public, and the offices, uh, you can come there if you're doing a quilt tour. And oh, you, make you arrangements. Can? You have to make arrangements, but That's yes. That's fabulous. So have you ever taken it out and shown it other places? Well, it was, uh, um, the original collection went on the road, and this collection we will probably take out in a couple of years when it's complete, and we've really had it around. We have to, you have to have, um, when you take, a collection like that on the road, you have to have something to put in its place while you're gone. While it's oh, gone. I see. And talking about going on the road, I was mentioning the fabric of what you're wearing today. It's what we need to wear when yep. we go on the road. Right. You can crinkle it up, or you can wear it every single day with something mm -hmm. else. What kind of uh, fabric is that? The, well, this is viscose. That's a, that's how I'll describe it on the road, on is the road fashion. No, I will now. <laughs> no, but you know it's true when you're traveling, which so many of us are you have to be able to count on your clothes looking okay when you get there and you you don't have the same kind of services in hotels they're going to come up and press everything in 10 minutes so it's very important because all of us working on developing the product are travelers and we we design for ourselves we want clothes to work in our lifestyles will susie tompkins the uh, new label also be involved in the social issues that you were involved in before women's issues mm -hmm. and very definitely very definitely. I mean, we feel really strongly and very proud about our involvement in women's issues. Arts education, I Arts think education, you're involved right. in. Arts education, And the environment. Everything. <laughs> do, you, do you put anything on your labeling, or how do you get let people know that you really are involved? Well, I just, I think people realize that. As last night I went to a fantastic um, exhibition at the San Francisco Museum on Dorothea Lang, which I just want to say is so great. Is that furniture? No, no, no. She's a photographer. She documented the Depression in the most elegant, beautiful, and, you know, these pictures have such a sense of dignity and hope. And it's so beautiful, and I think this is going to be a very, very important show for our nation just to see what we went through to see that what period. to see what we have already recovered from and to give us courage and to give us trust and to you know find the pride to get us through it this is a, a magnificent body of work really really impressive but you'll i'm sure the way you're talking about this you're going to find some way to incorporate these things into your designs and we have a couple of things on the set can you just explain them? Just well, there's a, a, um, a message here that is also very current. I mean, these are the, f the fashions of today with so many vests and sleeveless things. But also we try to use fabrics that really feel like the past. And these prints are very reminiscent of the 40s prints, and we've always loved those. So that really mm -hmm. falls into place with the... Um photo exhibition well, from the 40s. I've always loved the 40s. I think the 40s was such an incredibly um, elegant moment in our history. When you talk about design philosophy, if someone bought, say I bought this uh, two-piece that you're wearing, because I absolutely adore it, w would I have to throw it away next year? No. That Part of our philosophy is that we want to help people build a wardrobe, and that it's not the we don't take trend and exploit it. You'll see that every season you'll be able to look at it and you say, oh, that was the year that this was happening. But it's not screeching about the trend. It's mm -hmm. just, it's represented. But I think it's really important um, that women feel that when they're buying clothes, that the clothes they buy are going to serve them for a long time and they're not going to throw them away because they're out of fashion the next year. I know. I think that's the thing that we're all starting to understand now. And if the designers start understanding it, then I think women can, can go along with it. Well, I think that women design it, designers understand it a lot more than <laughs> men designers. And I think that there's a lot of clothes on the market that 
are you know reasonable in what we like to wear and and work. So Do you have to go to make a lot of store appearances? No, I, I very, very, very rarely do it. I happen to be a big fan of iMagnons, and I, you know, just sort of love to participate in anything they're doing. I'm, I'm, was, I used to buy my school uniform with white gloves on and a little hat. My mother would take me to iMagnons, and on the seventh floor, um, I'd buy my school uniform. So you're now selling. <laughs> so we said they've been very good to us, and I think that um, our product does very well there. And um, I think the store is so elegant and it just gives me a lot of hope. Well, we're glad that you came to iMagnons Beverly Hills because we haven't seen you for years and years. And you have, your family's grown up, your daughters have grown up, and you have somebody else with you on your <laughs> lap. <laughs> oh, my little Gracie. Her name is Gracie, and she's been going everywhere with me since Christmas Day. She was a Christmas present from my two daughters. And how? And what kind of dog? She's is a she? Jack Russell Terrier, and she's very unusual because she's really calm. And usually, Jack Russell Terriers are kind of hyper, but she's she's very appropriate. She gets excited when we go out into the country. Doesn't look like she's excited <laughs> at all. Now, if you want to know anything else about Susie Tompkins' <laughs> Jack Russell Terrier, keep riding to us at 520 South Grand. Uh, eighth floor, Los Angeles, 971. And thanks for being with us on the Joan Quinn Profiles. And we'll see you next time. Bye, Susie. Bye, bye, Joan. She really is good, isn't she? <laughs> well